From staff shortages to providing quality care, Iowa nursing homes face many challenges. We'll talk about the issues and what the industry and policymakers should do on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is rooted in Iowa. Elite was founded 30 years ago in Dubuque and owned by 1,200 Iowans from more than 45 counties. With resorts in Riverside, Davenport, and Larchwood, Iowa, Elite is committed to the communities we serve. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, July 7th edition of Iowa Press. Here is Kay Henderson. Iowa nursing homes face workforce issues and their financial woes were a topic of debate in the Iowa legislature this past spring. Our two guests today are intimately familiar with the industry and are watching it closely. Brent Willett is with the Iowa Healthcare Association. It's essentially the trade group for um, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and in-home care agencies. Brad Anderson is the state director of AARP and represents retired persons and anyone who wants to join that organization. Gentlemen, welcome back to Iowa Press for this discussion today. Thank you, Kay. It's good to be here. Also joining the conversation, Katie Aiken of the Des Moines Register and Aaron Murphy of the Gazette in Cedar Rapids. Gentlemen and, and uh, Brent, I'll start with you here. Uh, it's been a, a kind of a transitional uh, period, maybe is a soft way to say it, for the nursing home industry, a lot of closures in recent years. How, has that continued in 2023? How, how many nursing homes have closed in Iowa this year? We've seen an, a, a, a slowdown in closures in, in 2023. What I can say since 2020, really the advent of the pandemic, we've lost 29 nursing homes uh, in Iowa. The action of the Iowa legislature um, this session uh, pertaining uh, both in terms of a number of policy um, uh, priorities that, that assisted facilities as well as appropriations has helped to slow that down. Uh, but we still have a long, long row ahead of us. And we're going to get to those, so it's, it's good you bring that up. But are there others that are maybe teetering? Are there, are there facilities out there that are on the brink and still in danger right now? There, there absolutely are, and it predominantly relates to the availability of a qualified uh, workforce. And uh, certainly the topic of debate for virtually any, any sector, any profession in Iowa, uh, nursing facility level of care is, is no different. So a number of rural nursing homes are, are really hanging on right now. And Brad Anderson, for the people that your organization uh, represents and, and helps, what does this mean and how, how, how critical an issue is this? It's absolutely critical. And 40% uh, of uh, nursing homes in Iowa are currently experiencing a workforce shortage. So that is double the national average. And what, one of the things we know is workforce shortages lead to poor quality of care and um, closures as Brent mentioned, and so we've seen a couple dozen closures over the last couple years. One of the best ways to address the workforce shortage, in, at least in the short term, is to increase the pay of direct care workers who are currently making, on average, about $15 to $16 an hour. So if you're a single mom out there, which many direct care workers are, $15 to $16 an hour is not enough to get by. So we need to increase the pay of direct care workers. Um, you know, Aaron, I was going through some old files before uh, this show, and I came across this press release. And the press release was from 1998, and it was AARP Iowa calling to increase the pay of direct care workers. And so uh, this yellowed press release, I was looking at it, and it reminded me, the reason I'm bringing this up is because a lot of people frame this debate as a pandemic issue. And certainly, the pandemic exacerbated the workforce crisis in long-term care. There's no question about it. 
But it's not a pandemic issue. This is an issue that we have been dealing with in Iowa for decades. For decades, we have been calling on uh, the, the industry and the state and everyone to get together and find a way to increase the pay of direct care workers. And the reason we need to do it now more than ever is because of demand. And so there is going to be an increase of about 17% in demand for long-term care over the next decade. As a percentage of population over 60, the, 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 the percentage of population in Iowa over 60 is growing. The percentage of population under 60 is shrinking. Who is gonna do this work? It's something we need to address and we need to address quickly. We got all kinds of questions on that too. Mm -hmm. Katie has something on the legislation that you mentioned. Yeah, so just this year, the Iowa legislature passed a $15 million increase in the Medicaid reimbursement rate at Iowa nursing homes. They also passed a bill that puts a year-long moratorium on new nursing home construction or the addition of new beds. Uh, Brad, starting with you, what do those changes mean for Iowa? Well, um, the funding I do think is important. Um, you know, we, we, we need to do two things in terms of the workforce. We need to uh, stop the closure of nursing homes and address that issue. And we need to grow the home care industry in that workforce. So uh, the 15 million that you had mentioned for Medicaid is important. The thing that we would like to see is a little more transparency around how that money is being spent. And so is that money being spent on the workforce? Is it being spent on direct care for the uh, residents of the nursing homes? Or is it being spent on administration? Is it being spent on out-of-state investors? Right now in Iowa, we don't have a way of seeing exactly how that money is spent. In other states, they do. They require uh, an appropriation, a certain percentage of it, to be spent on direct care. At ARP, we would like to see more transparency uh, uh, how that money is spent. And it's not punitive, right? It, it, it's more instructive. We just want to see, is it working? So a year from now, we spent $15 million. Do we have more workers in the workforce? Uh, is it being spent wisely? Or do we need to increase, de decrease? What are the answers to all those questions? Let's have some transparency. And then Brent, what do you make of both that increase and the moratorium on new nursing home construction? Increase is incredibly important. It'll be met by a federal match because of the way the Medicaid program works for a total of about $42 million into the Iowa Medicaid system. And, and uh, Brad's uh, concern about transparency, we, we certainly um, have a, place a high level of priority on ensuring that taxpayers understand where their Medicaid dollars are going. Uh, Iowa nursing homes, like any nursing home in the in the country, virtually uh, submit what's called a cost report to the to Iowa Medicaid. Uh, that's a that's a publicly transparent document which documents exactly where those dollars are going. And what we know from those reports are that seven out of every ten dollars spent in Iowa Medicaid money in nursing home care goes to workforce, uh, goes to wages and benefits. Uh, and we certainly share the concern. That, that Brad and, and his members share about increasing worker wages. What we've seen since the uh, since that, that 2020 marker is that wages writ large in Iowa nursing homes have increased by 32%. Uh, uh, d direct care workers, uh, certified nurse aides specifically, have increased by more than 36%. Um, I think we used a number of $16 an hour. Brad, I think the most recent payroll-based journal numbers from the Centers for Medicare and Medicare Services show in Q1 of 23 the average uh, wage for a certified nurse aide was $21.13, so we've certainly seen a major increase since that marker as well. Pertaining to the Certificate of Need Moratorium, that's something, and you described it well, Katie, uh, which will halt uh, for a period of time the addition of new nursing home beds in Iowa. We think that's an important step, and the reason for that is that legislation calls for uh, the Department of Health and Human Services to get together and update what's called the nursing facility uh, bed need formula. That's a formula that determines, that's designed to determine uh, where, the, where the need is for nursing facility beds in Iowa counties. Uh, and we fully support updating that formula. It's been many years since it's been updated and ensuring that beds are going where they're needed and not where they're not uh, across our state. How many, what percentage of Iowa nursing homes are for profit versus not-for-profit? Uh, we have more uh, non-profit facilities in, in Iowa than, than for-profit facilities on a, per, on a percentage basis. So is it 60-40 maybe? The specific number uh, escapes me, but okay. I know that, that the majority are, are, uh, are non-profit. When you look at this 
15 million coupled with the moratorium. Did legislators do that so nursing homes wouldn't use the extra money to add on a couple more beds or uh, build a new facility? Um, I'm not sure those two debates were, were connected in, in that way. Uh, I, think, I think everybody, you know, look, we commend the Iowa legislature and Governor Reynolds and the Department of Health and Human Services for getting together and addressing an access to care issue that has, that has uh, uh, been exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, uh, and so the uh, investment in Iowa Medicaid, which will be met by that federal match, is designed to address a devastating shortfall that was faced for providers, the, the distinction between the cost of administering care and the reimbursement for that care. Brad, does AARP have a number that you think would be adequate in terms of the reimbursement rate or the state's contribution to it? We don't have a number, what we have is a balance. And so right now for older Iowans, the Medicaid balance is about 70% institutional care, 30% home-based care is where the funding is going. Of course, as you know, Kay, it's all about the money, right? And so uh, what we would like to see is more of a 50-50 split. And, um, and you know, we've had conversations with uh, Director Liz Matney, Director Kelly Garcia, uh, and they've been terrific, and they understand that it's imbalanced and they're working on a plan. What I would offer is we need to completely transform and modernize the industry as a whole in the long term. And <clears throat> let me share some numbers with you. We did a recent poll, and we asked, where do you want to receive long-term care? 78% of Iowans who responded to the poll said, we want to receive that care at home. 12% said in assisted living, 4% said in a nursing home. So home-based care is where Iowans want to receive that care. And if you look at the funding, the funding is, like I said, it's out of balance. And so we need to address where people want to receive care and invest in where they want to receive that care. Where they want to receive it is at home. Katie? So on the topic of in-home care, uh, I'm curious if you could talk about the difference in wage between an in-home care worker and the wages for a worker in a nursing home facility. Um, and as there is an increased demand for care in home, how is that changing the industry overall? Uh, we can start with Brent. Sure. Um, so we, we, rep, we proudly represent uh, hundreds of uh, home health care agencies and home care agencies across the state at our association. So we're uh, intimately invested in ensuring that that sector is uh, funded at an adequate level, uh, just like the rest of the long-term care, the, the long-term care system. Katie, you asked specifically about, about wages. Um, the wage distinction uh, between a, a home health care worker and a nursing home worker is, a, is a de depending on what, what specific job category you're looking for. But we know there are a number of policy prescriptions that we can take today to increase the, uh, the adequacy of, of payment and, and wages for home care workers. I'll give you one example. Um, uh, currently, Iowa, like, uh, like most states, uh, does not reimburse, does not make reimbursement available for the travel time associated uh, with a home health care aid. So, so uh, obviously, as, your tra as a home care aid is moving from home to home. In rural Iowa, sometimes those trips can be, can be um, many, many miles, uh, an hour or more. Uh, currently, our system does not allow reimbursement for the travel time associated with that, which artificially holds down uh, total wage levels. So there's a number of policy prescriptions that we can take to increase uh, that, that access to care. Uh, we believe absolutely, Brad, your, your numbers are, are, are of no surprise in, in, uh, at all that, that we believe that nursing facility level of care should absolutely be the last resort. It's, it's reserved for the most frail elderly Iowans who cannot safely be cared for at home. We want everyone uh, that can be safely cared for at home uh, to, to receive that care. Uh, and uh, we know that, that uh, the workforce challenges associated with home care are further exacerbated uh, by economies of scale. And, and so it's certainly a place that we would like. And, and I, I will again commend the legislature and Governor Reynolds for making permanent uh, Medicaid rate increases for rural home care agencies and uh, the HCBS elderly waiver system as a part of this last legislative session as well. Still, still work to do. What's the last part, ACBS? HCBS, Home and Community Based Service. Okay. 
okay. elderly waiver. So assisted living communities that provide Medicaid services, oh, okay. there was a uh, the rate that was increased uh, temporarily with federal COVID dollars last year was made permanent by the legislature in its appropriations process this year. Thanks. Um, there's a uh, some new federal requirements that are being discussed. Brent, we wanted to ask you about this that would set the minimum standards um, for staffing levels at nursing homes. Again, we're, it, it's it's kind of the the balance, right? That that's obviously something that nursing home wants want nursing homes want. Forgive me to to have enough people to care for the uh, residents. But we've talked about the workforce shortage. What what are your thoughts on those requirements and how that will impact the industry? You're right, Aaron. Every single nursing home in Iowa would hire more staff if that staff were available. I think we can say that about virtually every profession or industry uh, in our state. There's no question that there is a need for more staff. The question is what the instrument to, to actually make that happen is. A federal arbitrary mandate, which is what you're, you're uh, referencing, something that's proposed by the Biden administration, um, simply stated would, would require under penalty of ruinous fines uh, the mandated hiring of people who do not exist to care for people who do. And so I, w w when our association looks at the proposal that's before uh, the American people, is a, uh, would require the hiring of more than 2,000 new direct care workers at a cost of more than $100 million. If those 2,000 people were available today, I can assure you that, that they, would be, they would be hired immediately by Iowa nursing homes. And so the proposal shows a, a shocking lack of awareness about what's actually happening in rural health care by the Biden administration. Instead of creating an arbitrary mandate, we should be talking about real solutions to create more workforce to care for Iowa seniors. We should be talking about house, uh, housing tax credits for direct care workers, child care assistance, uh, telemedicine expansion. We should be talking about uh, uh, the, the more investment in home and community-based services. Instead, we are going, we're, we're going down the path of an arbitrary mandate, which will not create another single worker, but simply penalize employers who are desperately seeking workers today. Brad Anderson, does, has AARP um, considered these, this proposal? We have, and we support the mandate. And I don't, I don't know how arbitrary it is, only because my understanding of the mandate or regulation is that experts believe that's going to improve the quality of care. And in Iowa, it's something that we need to do. So let me start by saying there are good actors out there. And my mother-in-law recently went to a nursing home, and um, she was treated wonderfully and I'm grateful for that, and, and so I want to acknowledge that. But we also have some serious challenges when it comes to quality of care, and this new regulation is supposed to address those challenges. In Iowa, we've seen about a 45% increase in uh, complaints to the Department of Inspections of Appeal in Appeals, um, which, which investigates nursing homes. We've seen an increase in complaints to the long-term long care ombudsman. Uh, I dare anybody to read the Iowa Capital Dispatch on a regular basis and you will be uh, really concerned about what we're seeing in Iowa nursing homes today regarding abuse, neglect, um, and, and various other issues. So, uh, but, but we, can, we can talk about that and we should talk about that, but what I'd like to talk about is, is really what does the future of long-term care look like, right? And how do we address this quality issue, and it's, a, it's an important issue. So let me just paint a picture for you, Aaron, real quick. And the picture is, say a community, as opposed to investing in a shiny new nursing home, they invest in home-based care, and they find the workforce, they retrofit homes to allow older Iowans to age in place, which is where they wanna be. And then, but we also know that we still need skilled nursing, right? So they invest in a green home model. Now a green home model, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's where everybody gets their own room. There's a living room, there's a dining area, there's a community kitchen, uh, maybe a fireplace and outdoor seating. Um, but it's a smaller, more efficient nursing home. You have less staff turnover, fewer trips to the hospital, and a better quality of care. So now you've got home-based care, which is where people want to age. But if you need skilled nursing, you've got a place where people would want to go. That model is the future of long-term care. It's going to take a long time for us to get there culturally in Iowa. That's where we want to be. Now, we have other states, too. This greenhouse model is not a fantasy. Other states around us, Ohio, Minnesota, Missouri, Kansas, Illinois, 
They all have them. Iowa doesn't have a single greenhouse. Why is that? It's because we need to change our thinking and approach to long-term care. No, we need to move on, but Brent, I, I just wanted to give you a chance to respond to that. What, what about that idea uh, as a kind of an, uh, changing the way we look at the system yeah, I don't holistically? Think, I don't think this is a cultural issue um, at all. I think this is, a, this is a funding issue. So the greenhouse model is something that we absolutely support in Iowa. We also recognize that on a per patient basis, it's between five and eight times more expensive to care for an individual in a greenhouse model. We absolutely want people to receive that kind of elevated care, but we need to recognize that that would require extraordinary new investment, which we would certainly support, um, but we also need to, uh, in, we need to recognize that we are operating in, in the system that we are. Certainly uh, an opportunity to pilot a greenhouse system in, in our state is something we would support um, and an expansion based on available resources is, is, uh, uh, is, again, something we would support. Katie? Brad, you mentioned some of these unfortunate situations that have arisen at some Iowa nursing homes. You know, the Department of Inspections and Appeals does fine these homes, but some Iowans look at those fines and say, well, that's not enough given what happened here. You know, in terms of preventing situations from happening in Iowa nursing homes with inadequate care or negligence by staff, what needs to happen and should those fines be higher? Brad, you can start us off, but I'll come to you, Brent. <clears throat> I don't know uh, if the fines need to be higher. What needs to happen is workforce. And I mean, I hate to sound like a broken record, but when you have adequate staffing, you have fewer quality problems. And that is true across the board. And I think, Brent, you would agree with that. And, and so we need to find a way to build up the workforce. And that is a must. Now, when it comes to Iowans and what they should do about it, um, one of the things I would recommend is exactly what I did when uh, my mother-in-law was trying to pick a nursing home to go to. It's just go on Medicare.gov, nursing home compare, and see what gets the most stars. It's a five-star rating. Um, we said uh, nothing below four stars, essentially, is what we were looking for. And so we looked in the Des Moines area and we found a nursing home that had five stars and uh, she went there and received wonderful care. Unfortunately, we have a lot of one-star nursing homes and if you, if you click on the one-star, you'll see that there's uh, oftentimes a lack of workers, which is why it gets the one-star. And so. Um, it's not to oversimplify the issue, but if we don't solve the workforce crisis and start making that industry more appealing to the next generation, higher wages, improved working conditions, um, of, uh, the ability to advance with the career, then uh, we're going to have an enormous problem on our hands down the road because of the aging population. And Brent, we have just a few minutes left, but could you respond to whether those fines should be higher for some of these cases of negligence and what can be done to make these nursing homes um, prevent these situations from happening? Look, we, there, there's really no evidence that, that, fine, that, that uh, it, expanding the, the level of fines improves the patient uh, level of quality of care. Um, what we sh what, what every single incident of substandard quality of care should be investigated, and if that investigation proves to be founded, that provider should be penalized. We absolutely believe that. Um, we also believe that, we also know that in 2022, Iowa nursing home providers provided seven, about seven million days of care. Um, of those seven million days of care, those that resulted in about 2,112 incidents of inadequate care. It's less than, one, than, than half of 1%. Every single one of those 2,000 incidents of care should be investigated, and if they were founded, they should have been penalized. But we also need to be careful uh, not to uh, 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 suggest that the vast majority of the care that's being delivered by dedicated, hardworking Iowans every day is substandard. We, we have places to improve across our spectrum, and I absolutely support what Brad said. Use Nursing Home Compare. There's, a, there's another measure on there that speaks to staffing levels in nursing homes. About a minute left. Caregivers. Yeah, just to, uh, apologize for sneaking this in the end so as, as succinctly as you can. In, in our last minute, one group we haven't talked about is um, there are some people who receive care just from their family in their home. They're not 
paid workers is just the, the, that's literally the family they're t t taking care of of their loved ones uh, near the end of their life. Uh, is there anything policy wise, Brent? We'll start with you that we can be doing to help those people. Unpaid caregivers uh, are incurring billions and billions and billions of unpaid hours of care every single year, and we should absolutely recognize, understand, investigate, research uh, how that care is being administered, and develop federal solutions and funding uh, to make that kind of care more more feasible for families across the country. Brad? We have to do everything we can to support care, unpaid caregivers. We have 330,000 unpaid caregivers in the state of Iowa. Uh, one of the things, specific things that we support at AARP, uh, Senator Joni Ernst introduced the Credit for Caring Act, which would give caregivers a $5,000 tax credit every year. Uh, at AARP, we're strongly supportive of that. And we would like to see eventually that bill passed. Um, you both said federal solutions. Is there anything at the state level that you support, Brad? Well, I support education at the state level. And in fact, I was just having a conversation with someone here at the studio. Uh, if you have a question about caregiving, the best place to start, especially with older Iowans, is, are the area, is the Area Agency on Aging. Call your local AAA and they'll help you out. Gentlemen, to both of you, thanks for being on this edition of Iowa Press. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can watch every edition of Iowa Press online at iowapbs.org. For everyone here at Iowa PBS, thanks for watching. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is rooted in Iowa. Elite's 1,600 employees are our company's greatest asset. A family-run business, Elite supports volunteerism, encourages promotions from within, and shares profits with our employees. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com.